Oh, is this is this Sean over here? This is still I still see the presenter mode. Uh, Maybe display settings at the top there. Um, oh. There we go. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. All right, we're letting everybody in. Live stream is good. I'm going to go ahead and start the recording and you can get started, Jarvis. Okay. Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing? Good, good morning. I'm having a little bit of... Uh, Technical difficulties, but we got a lot of screens going up. It's first time trying to share a PowerPoint with everyone, so making sure I can see everyone. How's everybody's week been so far? I know it's only Tuesday. How was your Monday? Hard to come back? Mondays are always hard. Yes, they are. And the weekend always goes by so quick. It does, but this fall weather is starting to help. These fall yeah. activities. I mean, I know it's a little toasty still, but it's it's a nice change. It is, definitely. Okay. All right. Well, if I'm looking back and forth, it's because I'm, I'm trying to figure out where my screens are at. So, um, so Jarvis, I'm Jarvis Dolman. I'm the section director for Chaco Licen Licensing Operations for KDHE. I'm going to run the meeting today or get us kicked off at least. Uh, Melissa is in Indianapolis at a at the Naricon uh, conference. So I think she left out Saturday and I think she'll be back Thursday. So um, I'm going to kick us off here. And um, I believe everyone got the email um, last week about how we kind of wanted to run the meeting today. Um, we had some changes to our plans for our uh, regulation process so um had some direction that we wanted to get a little bit more feedback on our some of our regulations before we move forward so we felt this would be a good time and a good team to use for that um to, to go over these changes and and make sure we're still heading in the right direction with everything and just get feedback so we felt like we wanted to we didn't want to put a time constriction on um on our our on you all's questions so we wanted to Part of part of part of us were thinking like let's just have a small section for um, questions and answers, but we felt like we didn't want to put a time constraints on on if you all had questions. So we felt like we'd leave this whole whole meeting open for for questions and answers. And if we get done early, we get done early. Or if we go a little long, then that's okay too. But um, just wanted to use this time strictly for for feedback. So um, let's see here. So we do have uh, just a little welcome. I uh, welcome myself or um, welcomed everyone myself. So I'll let Derek do his welcome and then I'll um, kind of let everyone else know who we got on the call or kind of how the process is going to go. Oh, man. All right. Thanks, Jarvis. Hey, guys. Um, if you haven't met me yet, I'm Derek Flerlog. I am one of the bureau directors in the Bureau of Family Health here at KDHE, along with our co-director, Dr. Uh, Jesse Piper. I directly oversee child care licensing and then our state WIG program, as, we're, as well as our administration and policy team, which houses most of our regulatory work. Um, blessed to be here with you guys this morning. Super excited to sort of get some of these um, final proposals in front of you and get some feedback before we enter. Um, I mean, we're beyond the final stages. We, we enter that very final stage, I should say, of... Um, getting updated regulations submitted and kind of going through the official process. So I do want to thank everybody. Um, everyone's provided feedback in, in different capacities. This group is a well-rounded uh, group of experts in your respected fields, and everyone has different levels of expertise in different areas. And so it's been a really great opportunity to get feedback from you all on a variety of things. We appreciate 
all of the emails, all of the uh, survey responses, uh, the PDF documents that we've received from some, the in-person meetings that we've had uh, with some that were requested, um, Zoom calls, Teams calls, all of that stuff has been wonderful. And um, I think we feel really, really good about the work that's been done. And I also wanna shout out our team here. They've uh, lived and breathed uh, regulations um, about as much as you possibly can uh, for the last several months. Um, and so thankful for the work that they've put in too. Um, to be quite honest, it's easy for me when you have a team like this that's that's kind of with you in it. So um, appreciate all the work that everybody's done and feel free to uh, let us know if you need anything, regulatory or not. Thanks, Jarvis. Yep. All right, we'll move to the next slide. And um, Derek mentioned the, the team here. So we got Allison and Lucas here. So I'll just let them give a wave or if they want to introduce themselves again, um, we can go from there. Yeah. Hey, good morning, guys. I'm Allison Dalrymple. Um, you may remember me um, giving the last two set presentations that we had over the summer. So I will be kind of facilitating the Q&A session in just a bit. Um, yeah, general updates, I guess. We're essentially done with our initial drafts of all the regulations. I'll go in a little bit more detail um, about the email that you guys received as we go into the Q&A session as it starts. So I'll wait to do that. Um, I'll let Lucas introduce himself. Sorry, it wasn't unmuting. Hi, everybody. I'm Lucas Ryan. I'm the Regulation and Policy Specialist in the Administration and Policy section of the Bureau. Um, I mostly do kind of support role research, drafting, things like that. I'm just here to help the process go smoothly. Right. And also to uh, help us facilitate questions today, we got some of uh, our licensing uh, other staff on, some uh, DS, DSs and a few surveyors, I believe, um, they're going to help with the process. So I don't know if you all are KDHE surveyors and, and staff, um, if you wanted to wave your hand, if you want to sit, come off mute and say hello, um, however you wanted to. Um, Jennifer or Tina, or if you, any, any of you guys want to do that. Quick wave. Right. And anybody else, uh, KDHE surveyors, they're on, they're going to help out and want to give a quick wave. All right. Okay, so yeah, we're just going to go ahead and move into it. Um, hopefully everybody had a chance to read over everything like Allison said, and I'll pass it over to her and um, kind of open things up. All right, good morning, guys. So I'm just going to give a quick recap over the email that you guys received, just a super quick recap over the entire regulation process like I did um, initially, and then we'll just get started into the Q&A. So I believe on the 14th, um, you guys should have all received an email from Clayton um, about the SIP meeting. So when we kind of changed gears um, about where we were going with the SIP meeting today. Um, just a general recap, we are doing a very big regulation review, as you um, probably well remember. Um, these, we've identified 60 regulations initially. They were broken down into four different categories. Again, the first category was the Child Care Development Fund or CCDF requirements um, that we had to meet from our federal partners at the Office of Child Care um, to still receive federal funding. Those were typically health and safety items that needed to be increased or bolstered. Category two were those big ticket items such as the uh, capacity, ratios, qualifications, things like that, um, as well as uh, general regulations that we worked with DCF on. Category three were all of kind of the remaining child care center preschool regulations that we felt needed to be modernized or standardized. A lot of these regulations that you might see, there's, there's like a little history piece at the end of each regulation. The most recent year is the last year it was touched. A lot of these were last amended in the 80s. So there's just a lot of updates that we needed to make to modernize and kind of update and bring it to today's standards. Allison, I'm I, I don't know if we're supposed to be seeing um, a change in the slideshow, but all it still says is just showing you and Lucas's names. I didn't know if there was slides you're moving forward. We're not seeing. No, no slides for my little. Okay. Just little, making sure. Sorry. No, yep. Sorry. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate that. And just to know, I appreciate you guys um, raising up and, and talking a little bit. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second, but when we do our Q and a session, um, we'll 
very heavily rely on whoever can best answer your guys's questions. Some of those may be program specific questions about why something is the way it is that I will lean on, you know, Jennifer or Tina to answer. Um, and any questions that we cannot answer for you guys, we will record and follow up with you guys on a separate email. Um, yeah, so just wanted to note that. So, um, and then finally, category four were the school age program and drop-in program regulations. Little caveat to that one. We did look at those regulations. Um, we did do initial edits with those, but after meeting with some of their stakeholders, um, some of the school age drop-in um, program stakeholders, we determined that a huge official comprehensive review of all school age and drop-in program regulations were necessary. So um, there is a quote unquote out of school time summit, um, which encompasses school age and drop-in program regulations on October 11th in person um, with a virtual option. It's at the Sunflower Foundation here in Topeka where we will open up all of those regulations and kind of dive a bit more deeper into those as well. So um, out of the four categories, we have officially drafted 43 of them um, that are ready for concurrence to get approved and sent through the concurrence process to get promulgated, which is approved. Um, that process, just to give a quick overview, once we send it through concurrence, um, it'll need to be approved and signed by three different um, entities, essentially. The, um, Department of Administration, the Division of Budget, and the Attorney General's Office. After that, there will be a 60-day public comment period, official. It'll be posted on the website as well as all drafted regulations. So the whole, what, 150 pages of them will be posted online for everyone to see. Um, 60 days to where people can submit um, emails or phone calls or just give any kind of feedback. There'll probably be a survey for that as well. There's a ton of surveys for this whole process. Um, there will also be a JCAR testimony, which is the um, kind of the committee that handles rules and regulations. After the 60-day public comment period, there will be an in-person public hearing. Um, it'll be one for all of the regulations, by the way. Um, and that'll be, I don't know where that will be held. We'll kind of have to get a, a gear on how many people are going to be showing up or how many we expect. But that'll just be a chance to receive written um, and verbal testimony but not a forum for any kind of discussion. So that's kind of what that looks like. Um, after that, if everything's approved, um, eventually it'll just get, it'll get posted in the Kansas register and, and published and approved 15 days later, essentially. So um, there's no timeline for when these will get approved. It'll be um, a, as long as it takes for those three entities to give their signatures and review, which might take a little bit of time. So um, that's just a general update about where we're at. They're packaged and ready to go. The purpose of this Q&A session is we gave you guys um, like a general overview of some of the big ticket items, um, such as, you know, some of the health and safety requirements, some of the CPR things we were changing, removing the pit bull ban, things like that, as well as really focused on the capacity ratios and qualifications. What we really wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything within the regulations that we were changing additionally um, that might create some issues or have some, some problems once promulgated. Essentially, we just want to make sure that nobody's going to be blindsided or shocked or anything about any of the changes we're making. We want to be completely transparent um, with everything that we are proposing. That being said, we created three summary of changes. Um, documents that were sent to you guys for review. This has, we went line by line through all of the regulations and wrote down more detailed of the items that we were changing, as well as typically a reason why they were changed. A lot of this was just modernizing or alignment. Um, and then, of course, we added the out of school time flyer as well. That being said, we're hoping um, that you guys came with some questions or comments about clarification items. Um, if you guys need help understanding a change that was made or why a change was made, or if something was really removed or if it was just moved to a different section, um, why things were moved and, and, and whatnot. So we'll go ahead and kick off the Q&A session with anyone who wants to come off of mute. And like I said, we'll determine who can best answer your questions within our team. Can you hear me okay? I sure can. You can hear me? Okay. 
Um, mine is uh, deals with the family child care homes. I just had three items I wanted to ask about. One is a medication training going to be yearly was one thing. Um, then on for breast milk and um, will that, will you be able to write your own policies on breast milk? And then on three, <clears throat> prohibiting swaddling. On that, I think you should have the AAP website or I have looked into that and I can't find where they are now prohibiting swaddling. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, no. Then with that also will be, will you still allow sleep blankets? S sleep blankets? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so those are really good questions. Um, thank you. Uh, for number one, the medication training, this is not necessarily going to be annually. This is just going to be everyone, I believe. I'm, yeah, someone correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm going to caveat that literally with every answer that I give. Um, it's going to be initial for everybody, a part of orientation um, and the initial health and safety training for everybody. Um, it can be a part of the annual health and safety training. The um, four out of the 16 hours must be in a health and safety topic. So that can be included um, as one of the 16 hours of, of annual in-service training. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, it is not going, it's not mandated to be an annual training, um, just initial. The breast milk policy. So we worked with our partners at the Kansas Breastfeeding Coalition to come up with this language. Um, you are more than welcome to create your own breast milk policy as long as it meets the minimum standards that we have within regulation. So just making sure the reason that those were put in there is just to make sure that the kiddos stay healthy and the breast milk is fresh and, and hasn't expired and just making sure the storage of that is correct. Um, but if you want to go more strict or have a different method, as long as it meets those minimum requirements, um, you can create your own breast, um, breast milk policy as far as I'm concerned. And then the swaddling prohibition, we'll have to find the actual research for that. Um, I wonder if I can have Lucas, if you can do a quick search right okay, cool. yeah i was typing in the chat <laughs> sounds good awesome um, so he'll he'll follow up with that one um so the swaddling prohibition is i uh, just put the link for caring for our children where it discusses swaddling um it didn't explicitly say that swaddling is banned but it says that it's unnecessary and because of the risks it should be strongly discouraged and so it was kind of with discussion with melissa and the rest of program that it was determined that because of the risk factors the the move was to remove swaddling as an acceptable practice and we also um, did remove the use of blankets for children who are 12 months and younger. However, we do still encourage um, like those sleep sacks essentially that zip and the kiddos have their arms and everything. So, um, but no, no free moving blankets um, within the, the crib as well. Um, and that's also a very similar safety concern. Thank you. Does that answer your questions? And anyone, again, correct me if I'm wrong during this entire process. This is Christy Shun, and I work for the Kansas Infant Death and SIDS Network. And so um, everything you just said is um, kosher from what I'm hearing. So, I mean, they haven't outlawed swaddling, um, but I can see where they put it in regulations. It's kind of a hard line to explain to families. So I can see why they put that in there. So I think you're both right. Um, and the wearable blanket um, is what we call the sleep sack. Sleep sack's kind of a trademark. And so we try to refer to it as um, a wearable blanket. And then the, the real goal is to keep loose blankets out of the bed. Um, the thing that's hard about swaddling is that babies all flip over at different times. And what we don't want is swaddled infants on their tummies. And so that's a real hard line to figure out. So I think that's probably why you're saying what you're saying. Along the lines of safe sleep. Um, so I sit on the other committee with Melissa. And two of the things when I was reading over the regulations that I had questions about is, is there any way to say that bumpers 
are not allowed. Um, and then, and maybe it does, and I missed it. I was trying to comb through it the other day. So that's one question I have. Um, the second is, and this is where I, I brought it up in the other meeting, and I, I'm not exactly sure where sort of the stem of this issue comes from, but like we need to have cribs in child care. But we also say that portable cribs, so the American Academy of Pediatrics, the safe sleep recommendations, that portable cribs are safe. Um, and they have a bassinet feature. And I know in childcare, you can't use the bassinet. So I, I wondered if there was any conversation about saying crib, portable crib is a safe sleep environment. Um, because like when I'm training people to be safe sleep instructors, that's a caveat that we have to work on if they're training childcare providers or parents or other caregivers that they aren't allowed to use the portable crib. So I just wanted to raise that question and see um, if there's been discussion about it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm just, and again, um, as we're working through this process, it might take me a minute. I'm, I pull, I'm going to pull up the drafted regulations just to ensure that we have what we have in here. Um, let me check that in that. Okay, so for... Um, we do specify in drafted language that the child shall sleep in a crib or playpen that is free of any soft items, including pillows, quilts, blankets, bumpers, comforters, sheepskins, flatskins, cloth diapers, bibs, stuffed animals, and toys. So we do include bumpers as a prohibited item. Um, and then we also state that bassinets shall not be prohibited, but that playpens are. So essentially you can use a, um, a pack and play but you can't have the bassinet feature is what I'm understanding. And surveyors, let me know if that's what you guys interpret as well. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. These are super good questions, I really appreciate it. And if you guys like totally fine, like it, I sometimes I don't do my homework ahead of time. So if you guys need some time to review the drafted language and come up with something, that's fine too. Awkward silences are good in, in a lot of cases. I'm looking on this draft under the homes um, where it's talking about uh, 28.4.118, medication administration and reporting suspected abuse and neglect. Mm -hmm. And it says we're removing administ medication administration from the title and putting it under 132. Yes. Is that just a typo? Nope, I mean, nope. Just... Yeah, so medication administration training requirement itself is now within the um, orientation and initial health and safety training. So we added medication administration training as an object to be put in the health and safety slash orientation. For However, the 114. Yes, yeah. Uh -huh. However, the 118, which kind of stated... Um, as far as I believe it was like the training needs to be approved by the secretary and all that fun stuff by putting it in the health and safety training, it already does need to be approved by the secretary. So that did need to be restated. The medication administrating administration practice itself with how to administer meds, who can administer meds, who can write the meds, um, how to give the meds, how to label, all of that has been moved to 132 which is a general regulation that applies to both the home setting and centers and preschools. And so since they're treated the same with how to administer medications, we moved it to a regulation where a lot of these changes, and I'll just caveat this, a lot of the changes that are made, some of them are that we move them to a general regulation, which means we had it identical in homes and we had the same thing within centers and preschools. And so if a change needed to be made, we had to make it in both places, whereas moving it to a general regulation applies to all three of those facility types, but we only have to change it once. So it's been moved to 132, um, but it just specifies how to give and store and label medications, essentially. And so that regulation now is like two lines, and it pretty much says how to... Um, how to report suspected child abuse and neglect. So it's a very small regulation now. Um, um, go ahead. I had a quick um, question. 
on 28 or 428 for staff requirements. Yeah. Um, it states uh, allow a child to move to the next age appropriate unit 30 days before or 30 days after the intended move up date, which I think is great. Um, I'm wondering, does this does the phrase next age appropriate unit now take off the condition of walking or transition between infant and toddler? That's a good question. I don't think that we included the walking for the infant to toddler specific one. I believe, and this may be an interpretation thing within the centers themselves. Um, in practice, I would assume that if a child is moving up from the infant to toddler unit, that walking is to be a requirement. Um, so say they're walking at 11 months old, then they could move up to the toddler unit um, as far as I'm concerned. But that wasn't written specifically in there because we wanted it to span across all of the age specific rooms. Um, does that make sense? So I don't know how the surveyors would or the programs would interpret that. And that, that may be an interpretation um, piece that we would provide to the to all. Um, like program directors um, is to make sure that the infants, if they are to move up early, that they must be walking as well. I'm fairly certain that's going to be a requirement regardless, but um, that's a good point that we didn't specifically write that piece, the walking piece into that specific regulation. Well, I guess my feedback would just be to remove the walking piece and instead use more inclusive language along the lines of um, you know, a developmentally appropriate classroom or the classroom and the teacher or the teacher and the parents has a plan in place to address any safety concerns for the child to remain in the more developmentally appropriate classroom, yeah. just so that that one motor milestone isn't the barrier between a developmentally appropriate placement for children. Yeah, absolutely. Let me actually, I'm going to go ahead and just read the proposed language and see what it sounds like. <laughs> um, each applicant with a TP or each licensee may move any child into the next age appropriate unit not earlier than 30 days, 30 calendar days before, not later than 30 calendar days after the child reaches the minimum age of the unit. So the next age appropriate unit. Upon agreement with the parent or legal guardian that the move is in the best interest of the child, a plan to move any child to the next age appropriate unit shall be developed and communicated with the parent or legal guardian. So essentially the parent needs to agree um, and it needs to be in the best interest of the child. Allison, can I, I wanted to point out that the part about walking is part of definitions of what an infant or what a toddler is. So my understanding is that isn't changing in this regulation review that we're doing. So, um, you know, it might be that if they're getting ready to walk or they started toddling, but they're not walking super steadily yet or something of that nature, it would be appropriate to start that transition process to the next room. But the walking is part of the definitions. That would be why it's not in the specific regulation that you're addressing right now. Thank you, Jennifer. So then I guess my feedback would be to change the definition <laughs> to be inclusive. Thank you. I think someone else had a question at the same time, right? I did. It's also a definitions question, but on, well, maybe, but on a slightly different track. So when we're thinking about um, qualifications for um, centers, for program directors, and for teachers, I really appreciate um, all the conversations we've had about staff who might be moving from uh, teaching in accredited public or private schools into teaching in licensed childcare facilities and places where um, they might not have had previous experience in a licensed facility. My wondering is when we're thinking about people who uh, either have degrees or who have been teaching in elementary settings, 
Um, I see in here that we have experience in early childhood education, and I'm curious, um, I think we can probably all agree that that begins at birth, but when we're thinking about the upper age range of early childhood education, uh, is that something that would get into the early elementary ages, or are we envisioning birth to five? And my hope is that it gets into that early elementary. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would like to defer that question to staff. I, in discussions with this, we were hoping to be more inclusive of those situations, Amanda. That's a really good question. Thank you. Um, there was, I mean, so there was, in, there was intention in removing the, the, the specifics that the experience had to be in a licensed facility because we wanted to be inclusive of those who had maybe been a principal of, of an elementary school and have them be included as a possible candidate for a program director. Um, so we really wanted to speak to like all spectrums of experience and education. Um, based on conversations that I've had with the program on what they wanted, that would be um, early, it just says early childhood. So really you can go, um, I'm not sure what that definition would be, but I would think that it would include principles of, of schools, um, even in past five, five years old. So, um, again, that I, I would almost defer that one to program though, just to make sure that that is something that like, if you were a high school principal, would you be eligible for, you know, would that meet the requirements of, um, a program director for, you know, a child care center? Yeah, I think that that could be <clears throat> be one we can take back and make sure we're all on the same page with, and make sure we get back uh, with you with a definite answer on that, Amanda. <clears throat> Perfect. Yeah, I think that thinking about people who have elementary education degrees and then people who have been teaching family and consumer science are good people to be thinking about as we're um, considering the kinds of examples that we tend to see. Yeah, and I think, and I don't know what that process is to um, like kind of a look at the qualifications for program directors versus um like licensees and uh, I yeah I think it's a lot on a case-by-case -case basis um to look at the qualifications and I don't know if there's like a couple of people that kind of look at them and say yeah this meets the qualifications or no this doesn't quite so unfortunately I don't know what that process is but um like Jarvis said we'll definitely ask that question and get back with you about more specifically what that process looks like to to determine what experience would would satisfy those requirements. Perfect. I appreciate it because I, I totally appreciate the um, the flexibility of being able to say a related academic discipline. But I mm -hmm. think also when we get to a place where maybe somebody has been in one region that has one interpretation and then moves somewhere else in the state or hears about their neighbors, then um, for some of those, it can be helpful to be really clear whether that's in regulation or in other guidance. Oh, absolutely. And I definitely, um, when, when drafting these, I definitely thought that that would be a specific piece that would have to be like um, kind of an interpretive guide or additional piece of of guidance about what, I mean, because we kind of, it is broad, so similar, um, similar education or just general early childhood. And we kind of anticipated those kind of questions being asked. So what would qualify? Um, that is definitely something that we had spoken about creating kind of a, a guide to help walk people through what what that would look like. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. And I did want to bring up the tables. Um, they are the same as the last time that they were presented to you. Um, Last time we presented, um, there was there was one change made that actually came from the SIT meeting. So you guys didn't see that final piece um, that was presented to the provider um, meeting that happened a few days later. The only difference was I think we had discussed the experience heavy piece of the program director qualifications. I think it said four years and that was it, um, but we changed it to six years or four years in a licensed facility to meet some of that education requirements. Um, that was um, expressed to us that would like to be in the regulation itself. So that was the only piece that's been changed since you guys last saw all of the ratios, qualifications, and tables. Um, I see that the tobacco product 
is being addressed in, in definitions. Is there anything that's going to address vaping? Yeah, so that should, let me pull up the definition. I just had it pulled up. I think I closed it. Nope, there it is. So we worked with our partners at, I believe, the Bureau of Health Promotions for that one. Um, our definition says tobacco product means any product that is made or derived from tobacco or that contains nicotine that is intended for human absorption, inhalation, or ingest ingestion, including by consumption or using a cigarette, cigar, pipe, chewing tobacco, snuff, snus, or vape device. So we do include vaping. Again, that was one of those modernizing things um, to make sure that we're up with the times. Okay. And then... Um... I noticed the facility definition uh, in the home regs. All, it still says, it didn't mention you were updating that one and it does refer to licensed and group daycare homes. So I'm assuming that's gonna need to be changed to family child care home. Yes, yeah, so facility now means um, okay. a family child care home, a daycare home or a group daycare home. We couldn't get rid completely of daycare home or group daycare home because there are other regulations that we have not opened, okay. such as background checks for this round that do still use the term daycare home and group daycare home. Okay. So until those are open and we can change those definitions, we can't switch everything just to family child care home so far. Okay. In 114, our, I mean, I know it, it addressed um, taking out outdated references to 2017, are you going to remove um, like the 2017 to 2000, ugh, 2019 where we were increasing the training hours? Yep, every those year? are all. Okay. Yep, those are all removed, and now it just takes 16 hours. Um, that okay. was just kind of incorporation for yeah, increasing um, in service hours. So now it's super simple, and it just states uh, just the 16 hours and. Okay. And then in uh, 116, I think it was, there's references to um, 18, uh, like bottle feeding, holding bottles and stuff for children under 18 months. I was wondering if that's something, instead of putting that specific age on there, if that could just be changed to any child who is bottle fed. Let's see. Does that make sense? Yeah, let me see if I can find it just to make sure. And those, I mean, I don't know that those were directly related to the breast milk preparation or formula preparation. And yeah. so that might be just getting into more stuff that we're not looking at right now. I don't know. So it does look like we left the, so if a child under 18 months of age is in care, the following requirement shall be met. Um, Just, and the only reason that comes up is because we have facilities where, you know, there might be a child over 18 months who is still bottle fed and is not capable of holding that bottle themselves. So, okay. but again, I don't, that might be something that happens later on. Okay. That's a good, that's a good point to make. because we did, I think this entire section just talks about um, breast milk and prepared formula. I guess it does talk about solid foods later down too. Um, let me make sure solid foods is under. Okay, so yeah, we would have to kind of rework the whole section. It just, because it states, um, it talks about solid foods too. So I think that's why we put an age limit on it. Okay. Um, as well as this, yeah. So solid foods was the only one. Anyway, that is a good point to make. And I'll, um, we'll talk about it with the program. There are, um, just a caveat there, this, this past legislative session, there was a law that was passed that states that all state um, I think it's all state agencies, at least according or at least applicable to us here at KDHE, um, we must review all regulations um, every five years. So um, regardless, just a caveat, the other regulations that we haven't touched will be opened within the next five years as well, um, as well as these will be reopened. Um, so depending on if 
updates and changes are substantial versus non-substantial, like this is best practice or this needs to be changed right now versus this is a good idea. Um, regardless, we will be opening these up again um, in the next couple of years just to meet the, the new law requirements. Um, so just a caveat that as well. I'm not saying that we're gonna push everything off till five years later, but just a caveat that it's not gonna be another 40 years before these are opened. Okay, um, on two, well, 127, it says the entire medical record, not just the health assessment and emergency medical treatment form must be taken to the medical facility if emergency medical treatment is needed. Um, is that going to include immunization or just those three, the medical record, health assessment, emergency medical release? Yeah, so the immunizations should be a part of the okay. medical record. Okay. And we're caveat that as well. Um, we're looking, I know currently the, um, I have to, and uh, program members, please correct me if I'm wrong. It's been months since we talked about this specific item. The health assessment form is called the medical record, but it doesn't include um, some of that. So essentially like the form itself, um, I think it's the health history form. I'm not sure, but it's called medical record. We're kind of wanting to change that a little bit. The medical record should be the file that encompasses all medical information, not just the one form. Um, so the medical record as a whole should include the health assessment, the health history, immunizations, and then any other additional items. But those three items um, at a minimum should be in the medical record in the file itself. And those can be stored electronically. By the way, that's been a caveat that we've had to explain to a lot of individuals um, that, that electronic is okay as long as it's able to be accessed all the time. Um, especially in, in um, emergency settings, or if your systems are down, there has to be a backup system, um, or if the program director's not there, someone else can access that information if needed. So electronic is fine, it just needs to be accessible. I think Bernie has a question. Um, yes, I have, so I have a couple of questions regarding um, the child care center. Um, and they're really definition questions. So I'm looking at like at attachment one and attachment two at the end of the document. And I see that um, there's not definition in, in this particular um, table in attachment one for infants and toddlers. Um, and I'm wondering if that's going to be addressed somewhere else because we do define children over two years of age um, but not infants and toddlers. So the infant and toddler um, definitions are within um, 28.4.420. Okay. An infant is a child between two weeks and 12 months of age or a child over 12 who has not learned to walk. And then toddler, we did talk about um, toddler means a child who has learned to walk and who is between 12 and 30 months of age. Okay, so similar to what they are now. Um, and then my other question on that table, um, and then I can move on to attachment two, I see there's a mixed age option um, for infants and older children, um, but there's not a mixed age option that doesn't include infants that would have higher ratios, is that correct? Correct. Um, so you can have up to six children. If you don't want to have infants at all, all six of your kiddos can be, you know, 13 months or older. Um, okay. But if you want to have infants, you have a cap of the infants that can be in care. Um, and this really speaks to, I think a lot of our small center pilots use this mixed age ratio. Um, and it kind of gives a nod to the home setting as well. But if you have like a general space, you can have you know, all like a wider range of kids that can be really accommodating to families and to centers, depending on what they need. Okay. Um, and then, uh, I'm so sorry, Bernie. A lot of times the mixed unit is used for the beginning of the day and the end of the day in a child care center. So when you're first opening at 6 a.m. and you don't have as many kids yet and you don't need to be fully staffed, you know, you can open that one room and have kids in there for a little while and then, you know, 
divide them out to their typical classroom for the rest of the day and then same at the end of the day. So that's also um, a purpose for that kind of a unit that's used very often. Um, and then my last question is, so I see that um, program director and lead teacher and assistant teacher qualifications have been um, kind of separated out. Um, and I did see that in the definitions that lead teacher and assistant teacher definitions would be added, but I'm wondering what those definitions are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's super similar to um, program director. It just states that an assistant teacher is a staff member of a childcare center or preschool who meets the requirements in the new 429D, which is the assistant teacher um, section, um, each assistant or, and who is responsible for assisting the lead teacher in the care of children within a unit. And then what we did was we added those, um, I know we had a lot of discussion about the, uh, I don't wanna call them core competencies because they're not, um, just essentially general things that each uh, staff member should be able to demonstrate. Um, so such as the ability to carry out assigned tasks, um, to implement age appropriate activities, um, understanding of and the ability to respond appropriately to children's needs, the ability to foster positive, healthy relationships with children, interpersonal skills necessary to communicate clearly. Um, those are So those are the five for assistant teachers. So we had an, originally drafted that as being a part of the regulation that we showed you guys. Um, the reason that we moved it to definition is because we didn't want it to be kind of a, an area for, I guess, like citation or some kind of negative connotation where we can cite in the absence of. We really wanted it to be kind of a guidance for the type of skills that that kind of staff member should be able to demonstrate when hiring. Um, so that was kind of the reasoning for putting it in the definition instead of in regulation itself, because there were some concerns that how are we going to cite this? Is it measurable? But that wasn't the intention of adding those in there in, in the first place. Um, lead teacher is super similar. So it's a staff member of a child care center or preschool who meets the requirements specified in 429C, so the, the lead teacher section, and who is responsible for the care and supervision of children within the unit. And then they also have the five um, being able to demonstrate just the general um, qualities of a lead teacher that we had already discussed. So those are what the definitions look like. We really just did it because we know that there wasn't a lead teacher definition, nor were the words lead teacher ever really stated in previous regulations. And it was a term that's used frequently, um, like in demonstration within the centers um, daily. So we definitely wanted to make it modernized and just make sure that we're using um, what is currently being used in today's child care world. So I guess from a regulatory standpoint, would an assistant teacher be qualified to be alone with a group of children? Give me just a second to do some quick research and pull up the regs. Um, I think, do you care if I jump in real quick, Allison? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I'm pretty sure if I'm remembering correct from our conversation, the because we had a lot of conversation around the language on a lead teacher being present with each unit. And so the way that we landed was that we, it was okay if it was within a unit where you had a lead teacher and an assistant teacher and like half of them were going to stay inside for an activity and the other half were going to go outside with the assistant teacher and they were going to kind of split the group that way that setting was okay but there still needed to be the lead teacher who was kind of responsible for the overall running of the unit of children and so you couldn't just assign a unit to the assistant teacher and say you're good this is entirely yours but they could be like they could split for activities. I guess I'm thinking about like covering breaks and like beginning and end of the day times, what, what that would look like under these definitions. Good question. Yeah. So we did add a section in here into 428, right under the, um, the capacity tables. We added a section that states, and this was due to some really big feedback that we got from our, our regulated community and our stakeholders, but it states that the child staff ratio shall be considered in compliance when a staff member leaves the unit without a substitute for no more than five minutes, providing that another staff member remains in the room at all times. Notice that we don't use assistant teacher or lead teacher, it's just staff member. Um, if a teaching staff member is absent for more than five minutes, but less than 20, 
the staff child ratio shall be considered in compliance when another staff member who is not a part of the teaching staff for that unit substitutes for the teaching staff member. So we do allow restroom breaks, quick breaks, um, while still remaining in compliance with the child staff ratio. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And silence is okay, I promise. <laughs> I know that you guys are probably all reviewing the um, the documents and stuff, trying to find different things to talk about if you have questions. I know I just said silence is awesome, but I'm going to put another plug in here. Um, we also sent the summary of changes to all of our child care providers as well, um, using, I believe, the listserv from Claris. So um, they will also be able to review all of the changes that we've sent to you guys um, and provide feedback via a survey. Again, another survey that we've created um, through survey one, two, three, um, just to solicit their feedback and answer any clarifying questions they may have as well, just as you guys have asked um, in today's session. So um, just to caveat that, um, yeah, so we're super excited to be super transparent with everybody and just make sure everyone's on the same page. Allison, we should have had some waiting music ready to go. I know, some elevator music. I guess I can ask, is everyone still like reviewing and reading it or have you reviewed it and you guys have no questions? Just a general question for most of you. <laughs> I have reviewed it all and uh, you guys did a great job. Um, I just, the questions, that's all the questions I had. I just want to thank you because you can tell you put a lot of work into it and I thank you for that. Thank you so much. I, we really appreciate it. This whole team has um, lived and breathed childcare regulations for months like Derek said. Um, yeah, that means a lot. Yeah. I and mean, we should say too, Allison, that obviously there's formal public comment and formal uh, public hearings for this as well. So, you know, should we start going through the process? And then you're like, oh, I have a thought. There's still time to share that, so. Yeah, absolutely. And after this meeting is over, um, if you guys continue to review and have any questions, absolutely just email myself and Lucas or the program um, and we'll certainly get back with you. Our, our, our goal is to answer all questions that you guys have about the changes to regulations. Again, we don't want to have any surprises um, at all when we publish these for public comment or the promulgation process to get approved. Um, and we, we say that for all of the thousands of child care um, providers that we had sent this to. Um, 
we do plan on answering for those who give their contact information. We do plan on returning um, and answering all questions that they have as applicable. If there's a question to be answered for clarification purposes, we will reach out um, following the survey if they submit any responses about um, their proposed changes, just so we can be, again, transparent and help help people out when they, um, if they have any questions about any of the changes that have been proposed. I'm excited to get these posted online, but again, there's like 150 pages, so there's a lot. All right, well, if no one has anything else, uh, if you do, while I'm still sitting here talking, go ahead and shoot it in the chat there. And of course, like um, Allison said, if there's anything else, you can you know let us know by email, we'll address it. Um, I'll just move ahead. We only got just a couple of things left. Um, just want to make sure we get in, um, talk about any, um, any exciting things going on in you all's world. So, um, you know, I think it was good to end on a, a good note and um, share some positive things. So if there's anyone, anyone that has anything to share, um, feel free to come off mute, raise your hand or however you want to do it and, you know, uh, go ahead and share with us. Hi everyone, Sarah from Child Care Aware of Kansas here. Um, there is a lot going on um, at Child Care Aware of Kansas, so I'm probably not going to capture every thing that's happening. Uh, we had an all team meeting yesterday where we shared some rapid fire updates and there's just a lot um, that I don't even realize sometimes is in motion. But um, I would like to take this opportunity to share with you all that we are in the thick of our shared services work. And uh, we are working with communities to stand up those shared service network hubs and um, the entities that have been identified to uh, do that work. And we are still offering that uh, free for 14 months child care management software usage for two of uh, the identified vendors that we have selected um, for providers. So there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on, and we're hopeful to uh, get as much engagement as possible so that we can continue to uh, advocate for this type of support. So uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and uh, we can chat a little bit more. Thank you, Sarah. Anybody else got anything you want to share? It's exciting to see um, some of the facilities are uh, implementing their accelerator grant funds and, you know, getting construction going, getting new things moving. So that's really exciting to see. like Clayton threw some uh, updates in the chat there. So feel free to read that. Okay, last thing here. Um, so we're gonna do a little poll here. We got our, our upcoming meetings, but um, before we do that, um, we wanted to check with everyone to see, um, wanted to put out a poll there to see if uh, everyone wants to keep 10 30 to 12 or if we want to move back to 10 to 11 30 so um, I believe Julia is gonna throw out a poll there um, for us to uh, do a little voting here before we get off um, so we can have a consensus there so if you want to take a few moments to do that sorry Clayton are you able to launch the poll for some reason it's not giving me the option anymore Yes, I just launched it. And just to give people context, our established meeting time had been 10 to 11.30, but when we were scheduling, we had a little mix up and accidentally scheduled the series from 10.30 to 12. So we just wanna make sure we go with the time that works best for everybody. And it looks like I've had 22 responses out of 27, 23 now 
Um, give it a few more seconds in case anyone's still on the fence. All right, it looks like it looks like it was pretty close. Yep. <laughs> Came down to the wire, didn't it? Okay. Yes. So um based on these results, we'll probably switch the meeting time back to the 10 to eleven thirty time that was initially established. But um it looks like this window works well for most people. It's just a difference of 30 minutes for what's preferable. So hopefully this time will continue to work. And of course, we have every um, third meeting in the evening, so. Right there, so on the screen are your next three meetings there with uh, the change being 10 to um, 1130 on, in October and December. And then the, the evening went there like Clayton just mentioned. So um, that is all we have for you all today. We give you some time back. Um, we definitely appreciate everyone hopping on and um, being ready to give feedback. Um, like Derek said, it's really important to us to make sure we get this right. Um, and we're really thankful for you all's input throughout the process. It's really helped us out and given us a lot of good insight. So um, I just want to give a shout out to, uh, while we're on here, um, Allison and Lucas and um, and uh, Melissa. She knows she's not on here, but me and Derek, we got really busy um, throughout the summer doing a lot of traveling. So um, they really, they really uh, did a great job of um, taking this project and making sure it was moving forward for for everyone and making sure all all things were taken care of. So just a huge shout out to them um, throughout this whole process. So, and with that, I don't know if Alice and Derek, you all have anything left. If not, we can say our goodbyes. Until next time. No, I don't have anything left. I dropped uh, Lucas and I's email in the chat again. If you guys continue to review um, the Word documents and you have any questions about if something was removed or just moved or what we meant by it or an interpretation of it, absolutely reach out to us at any time and we will be more than happy to get you that answer. And then Amanda, we will follow up um, with your question as well and provide you an answer as soon as we can. All right. Thank you, everybody. Y'all have a good